Hi, and welcome to 15 for Faith. I'm so glad you're here with me today. By now, you have probably heard the comments made by John MacArthur about Beth Moore. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit of that. I want to talk about why an understanding of the Bible really does prevent, well, progress. Uh, there are expressions of the faith that consider the Bible to be totally true and without error. I'm going to tell you why that is really stopping us from moving forward as a faith. Stick around, grab a coffee, I'm going to share my thoughts. Uh, by now, as I said earlier, you may have heard the comments made by uh, John MacArthur. You may not even know who John MacArthur is. So let me just tell you, he is a minister in one of the denominations of the Christian faith. And uh, he is an influential minister. He's been uh, considered, in, in some cases, uh, one of the most influential, top 50 or something like that. And uh, he made some comments recently in a kind of a convention that they were at. Someone was asking them to respond to one-word uh, one kind of statements. Uh, one or two word statements, uh, and then the panelists were supposed to respond. And in this particular event, uh, the, the person who was kind of hosting said the name Beth Moore. Now, Beth Moore, and, and directed it at John MacArthur. So Beth Moore, I guess, is a uh, Bible um, uh, teacher. Uh, she has a lot of stuff uh, that she has put out. You can probably find her stuff in bookstores and stuff, or maybe online, most likely online. Uh, but anyway, when uh, asked to make a response to the name Beth Moore, John MacArthur said, go home. Well, now, if you've been online, you may have seen that a lot of women clergy are not too happy about that because uh, the insinuation, in fact, not even insinuation, it was just a direct statement uh, that a woman should not be uh, leading Bible studies, that she shouldn't be in that position, shouldn't be doing what she's doing, uh, and in fact, that all clergy women shouldn't be in the clergy. Now, it's just a ridiculous statement to begin with, but that is the one that John MacArthur put forth. And it is a little bit um, unnerving, frustrating, maddening to some of us, and particularly to my clergy women friends that I think do an exceptionally good job. Uh, to eliminate their voice is ridiculous in my mind. Uh, but what I want to talk about is how a guy like John MacArthur can get to that place. Before I do that, let me say he also waltzed all over people of color, women of color, uh, people of color, immigrants, he, anybody seeking power. Hang on to that thought. He actually said that if we just give power to everybody who wants it, we're reducing the authority of Scripture, that that reduces the authority of Scripture. I want to keep that in mind. Keep You guys keep that in mind because I want to talk more about that and how that is so damaging to the faith and how it really stops progress. And, frankly, it's unchristlike. So we'll get to that in just a minute. But let me, uh, before I do that, uh, share some thoughts on the Bible because this particular expression of the faith that John MacArthur comes from does have a word that they say about the Bible. It's in one of their... Uh, statements about scripture and I wanted to read that to you I got it right here I wrote it down uh, it's an excerpt uh, what I excerpted out of here uh, but it says this that the Bible was written by men divinely inspired okay so second thing it says is in that same uh, paragraph it is without mixture of error that is there is no mixture of error in that let's keep that in mind too that seems a bit far-fetched to me and a little ridiculous but okay let's play it out and see what happens and therefore, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. You hear that? All Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. Uh, that means, of course, uh, in the mix of all the stuff that we believe, we also have to believe uh, in a talking donkey. Uh, that actually happened, Balaam's donkey, in uh, Numbers 22:28. Take a look at that if you don't believe me. Uh, serpents talk in the story of Genesis. You probably know that story. Uh, the temptation is a serpent that is speaking to uh, Eve in the first case and then Adam. And in that story, which is really good because this is his father for why John MacArthur says what John MacArthur says, uh, who is it that is tempted and succumbs to the temptation? It's Eve. It's the woman. So we're going to talk about that too. That's just, um, hmm, uh, taken literally, that's a bit of a problem. So, But that's the way I think that the expression of faith that John MacArthur comes from and from many others that the Bible is understood. That the Bible is understood in such a way that it actually is perfect. Now, here's the problem with that. Let's just take the Genesis story as an example. To begin with, that story that we have isn't one story. It's two stories of creation, so hang on to that for a second. Not only that, it's not original. The, the, the document uh, actually was written before them. It's a Babylonian creation epic. They took that text, the Hebrew people took that text, and looked at it and said, hmm, uh, good stuff, but we think for our context and what we believe, 
uh, we're going to shape it so that it fits more of who we are. And so they took that text and edited it and put it in uh, what is today our scriptures, in the Genesis story. And so you have a, a document that was really never pure, I guess, to begin with. It was not original to the Bible. It was actually a, a, a story written maybe hundreds uh, of years before. I mean, like maybe 500 years before, maybe 1,000 years before. But that story is not original to the Hebrew people. They took it and edited it for their context. Why would they do that? I believe that what they were doing is saying this. This is a faith story, not a fact story. This is a story of how we came to be. This is a story of how human beings get on earth and how we have a relationship with God, our understanding of who that God is, how we have relationship with one another. It explains the reality of the day in their context, which makes sense because then later, editors in the Bible, in Genesis, the Hebrew people have a different person, different writers that come along and edit that text again, which is why we have two creation stories, the hand and flood story and some other stuff that goes along with that. That the editors come along and they say, well, our context has changed. And if that's the case, the context changed, then the story has to change. Now, this editing and this kind of reworking of text is not unusual in Scripture. It's not across the board every text was, was changed. I'm not saying that, but it's not unusual either. Uh, to suggest that everything was edited would not be true, but to suggest nothing was edited and it all came straight from the pen of whoever was writing it as it was supposed to be isn't true either. And so you look at the text and you go, okay, then if it's been edited that many times, what does that mean about how we understand the text? Is it really without error? Is it really without any mistakes? Why would they have edited it to begin with? Well, what people in this particular expression of the faith will tell you is this, that even those changes and edits were inspired, that the Holy Spirit was at work even in that. God worked in their lives, inspiring them as they wrote, and as the context changed and they needed to make changes, the Holy Spirit was even guiding them in that. I'm okay with that. Let's hang on to that thought for just a minute, because I think I'm okay with that. And here's the reason. Because I think if the Holy Spirit was inspiring people back then to maybe make some contextual changes because life was changing around them, then perhaps we need to do the same today. And the only question that you can raise is this. Is the Holy Spirit still at work today in the same way and the same manner that the Holy Spirit was at work back when they wrote those scripture passages for the first time? Is the Holy Spirit still inspiring people even though the Bible has been canonized? Is the Holy Spirit still at work? Now, if you say the Holy Spirit isn't still at work, that's a tough thing to defend if you're a Christian person. However, if you say, no, the Holy Spirit is still at work in the lives of people, then maybe there are people prophesying today. Maybe there are people who are seeing visions today. Maybe there are people who are dreaming dreams today. Maybe there are all kinds of people upon whom the Holy Spirit is falling, and they have a word for us today, that the Holy Spirit is not dead. Now, if you are a John MacArthur and you think the Bible is without error, it is, in my opinion, how you can come to the conclusion that Beth Moore should go home and that all women should stop their leadership roles because it's scriptural. You can look it up. It's in 1 Timothy. It says, I permit no woman to teach a man, that they should learn in silence and be submissive to the man. And so he's taking that text and he's saying that's what it is. If that's the case and it's totally true and trustworthy, then this is what we should honor. Forgetting, of course, that the inner circle that Jesus walked with included women. Forgetting, of course, that women were instrumental in starting the church. Forgetting, of course, that the first people who witnessed Jesus not being in the tomb and actually having conversation uh, was a woman. And they had to write, uh, report that to the men. It is only then that the men come rushing in to see an empty tomb. So forgetting all that and just using one text, he can say, because this is without error, that this is what we should be adhering to. And to offer power to a woman would reduce the authority of Scripture. And I'm saying that is hugely problematic because the Holy Spirit is not dead. And that's the fundamental question here. Is the Holy Spirit still at work in our world today? So that's how John MacArthur gets to the place he is. He's going to take Scripture literally. That's the problem. Here's why he's wrong. As I've already pointed out, the scriptures were not written in that fashion. 
We're addressing particular topics at particular times for particular reasons. And to take things out of context is simply to use the Bible for your own purposes. Here's the alternative. The alternative is this. The Holy Spirit is still at work. The Holy Spirit is still inspiring writers, still inst inspiring prophets, still inspiring great visionaries and thinkers, still inspiring people with new ideas and new thoughts. The Holy Spirit did not stop inspiring simply because the Bible was canonized. And if that's the case, then that means voices of today, even your voice, is part of a great conversation of faith that should move us forward. That's the thing that always confuses me. Why hearken back to a day when they didn't know as much as we know? We know so much more now than they knew back then. Our context has changed, just like I explained in Genesis. The context has changed, therefore the material has to be changed as well nuanced in such a way that it includes the things we know today. So if we know about bacteria and we know about viruses and we know about genetics, we know about uh, sound waves, we know about uh, things in space that they couldn't have possibly known about. The world is not flat, it is actually a round earth. And not only that, but the earth is not the center of the universe. We know that as well. And not only that, in our galaxy, uh, we are not the center, but there are many, many galaxies out there. We know so much more than they know about emotional stability and the things that we go through about uh, different kinds of uh, mental illnesses and things. Those are all things that wouldn't have been information they knew, obviously. Surely that is obvious. And though the context has changed. And if that context has changed, let's listen to the Holy Spirit telling us what we need to know for today. What does the faith say to us today? What does a relationship with God look like for today? And that's the alternative, is to say, yes, the Holy Spirit is still at work. The Holy Spirit is still inspiring. I want you just to, to hear uh, two texts. Uh, one is from uh, the book of Acts, which uh, is called the Acts of the Apostles, but oftentimes called what? Right? You are correct. The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit seems to direct every movement that the people make in the book of Acts. But here is one in particular. This is from Acts 10, uh, 44. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Unbelievable. Even on people outside the faith. And so Peter concludes uh, with this, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? You see what's going on? The Holy Spirit is not limited to just a few people, not limited to just those who understand the Bible one way, but the Holy Spirit is still at work. Let me read to you from the book of Joel also. This comes from chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Then afterwards, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all the flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on male and female slaves, in those days I will pour out my spirit. That means that the Holy Spirit is at work in many lives, in many places, and the only thing you can conclude if the Bible is the final word is that the Holy Spirit stopped inspiring people today. I don't believe that. I believe absolutely the Holy Spirit is still at work and the Holy Spirit's at work in you. What will kill faith is when we stop engaging with faith, when we stop asking those questions. New ideas, new visions, new prophecy, new dreaming of dreams is not going to hurt the faith and kill the faith. In fact, it'll move it forward. It will help us to progress. That's what it'll help us do. No, what will kill the faith is apathy, when we stop engaging, when we stop seeing and looking for how the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, and when we discount that and say that the only answer is to go to the Bible, a book that was canonized, is 66 books, and is not God. It is a revelation about God, but it is not God, and God is still at work in the world today. So the Holy Spirit was at work, the Holy Spirit is at work, still, in your life and in mine. So I hope that you'll engage that. I hope that you'll ask those questions, those tough questions. Look at Scripture. It's unique in its authoritative witness to Jesus Christ. I would never deny that. I will just say this. It's not the final word on matters of faith in God. The Holy Spirit is still inspiring people today. So thanks so much for uh, watching. I really appreciate it. I hope that you will go to, uh, of course, my uh, website, which is 15forfaith.com. So thanks again so much for watching. I hope you'll watch next week. Take care, and remember, a little faith goes a long way. Thank you.